My name's Razine. I'm an astrophotographer from the United Kingdom and for some reason with our classic British weather I had the hankering to try out mono cameras again. So I asked Flo if they could hook me up and First Light Optics hooked me up and sent me a ZWO ASI 183mm Pro for review. So this is on loan from Flo. The filters were done in a different video so now we're going to talk about the camera. We're going to get straight into the meat of this camera which is the sensor, the reason why you're here I'm sure. It is a Sony IMX183 monochrome sensor. So that's basically hasn't got a color filter array or a bare matrix as you may know it. That's a load of tiny little filters, colored filters over the sensor. It is a 12-bit ADC sensor which supplies you 4096 shades of gray which is approximately 4093 more than the films. What this means for your imaging is that it results in a smoother picture so more shades of gray means more of a transition from one shade to another. Now, 12-bit is the lowest number I've seen for dedicated astro astrophotography cameras. They do from 12, 14, and 16. So just because it's the lowest, does that mean it's the worst? Well, no, that doesn't mean this camera can't hold its own. The 183 sensor is a relatively small 13.2 by 8.8 millimeter sensor with pixels that are tiny 2.4 micron. Now that is actually really quite small for astrophotography standards, which means that this is much more suited for wider field of view telescopes and camera lenses. Now this doesn't mean that you can't put this on a chuffing great big instrument and take really nice photos of planets. I can imagine this would be really good for that. I don't have a chuffing great big telescope to practice this with. If anyone else wants to chime in in the comments, be my guest. One thing you need to be aware of when using a sensor like this 15.9 millimeter diagonal, 2.7 times crop factor is your field of view. So what this means in English is if you've got a 100 millimeter camera lens, you put this camera onto it, you've effectively got a 270 millimeter camera lens, a much narrower field of view. This caught me off initially when I used a 183 before and on my ETED, it was just a lot tighter than I was anticipating. So I ended up getting a wider telescope. So don't fall into that same trap, go to Stellarium or astronomy tools, something like that, and just plug these in and make sure this is what you want and it works with your telescope. Now this sensor size and these pixel sizes gives you a whopping 20.18 megapixels. A lot of people argue this is excessive. Most conventional photography is eight megapixels. Astrophotography is probably about the same. People say the atmosphere limits how much you can actually use. One good thing about so many megapixels and so many pixels in itself is it gives you a lot of room for cropping and for printing. In practice, your images will be about 5,496 pixels by 3,672 pixels. Each photo records a decent amount of data, as you can imagine, 20.18 megapixels. Each photo is about 39.4 megabytes. So that might not sound like a lot on its own, but when you've took 40 or 50 photos, light frames, and you've got 50 darks, 50 dark flats and 50 flats, suddenly there's a few images there. So just be aware and make sure you've got a big enough hard drive or backup storage device or whatever you're doing. So on to full well. Full well is the fancy name given to how much light each pixel can take before it just blooms out to pure white. There is probably some logic and some mathematics you can do to figure out the right exposure per target, but I'm not that smart. The full well of this camera is 15,000 electrons. To put this into perspective, this is actually one of the lower values I've seen across dedicated Astro cameras, but the full well is kind of decided by the ADC of the sensor, which we've already decided is 12 bit. Generally, the bigger number here is better, but when you go to unity gain, which is where I imagine 90% of people are going to use this camera, your full well is actually about down to 4,000 ADU. That's a loss of about 73%. So quite a loss indeed. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because that then turns this camera into more of a short exposure monster. It's really good with shorter exposures. And instead of doing five, 10, 20 minute long pictures that you might use with some of the sensors, this is more suited for those two or three minute long broadband images and maybe five minutes when you're doing narrowband depending on your filter. Again, trial and error, I'm not that smart. And on to the point where it boasts about a 1.6 electron read noise. This is something I really distaste about specification sheets. 1.6 electron read noise is available at the highest gain. 
So that means it's useless effectively for deep sky imaging, for long exposures, because you have tiny wells and should really only be used for lucky imaging. The quantum efficiency of the camera, which is a fancy way of saying how well it uses the light, is about 84% on average, down to about 60% in the hydrogen alpha range. But don't worry, it's good enough, it's efficient enough in the main band of hydrogen alpha that you shouldn't really notice any degradation. I would actually say your, fil your HA filter will make more of a difference than the QE at this point. The really high quantum efficiency as well is another reason this lends itself quite well to a rapid fire short exposure camera. Onto the biggest, biggest Achilles heel of this camera is the amp glow. It's terrible on this camera, it's really pronounced. Now amplifier glow is this big starburst we see on the right hand side of the frame. This looks extremely dramatic, but it does actually calibrate out with dark frames. The main problem here is that I've had a hit in this relationship calibrating this starburst out. Deep Sky Stacker usually did a really good job of it. There was one time where I was exclusively having to use Astro Pixel processors, remove amp glow function, the only way I could calibrate this out. And weirdly, the other day, Affinity Photo stacked it and calibrated it out perfectly where Deep Sky Stacker couldn't. So if you're using APP or PixInsight, I imagine you're going to be really fine and it's hit and miss with Deep Sky Stacker. 99% of my images have calibrated just fine with DSS. It's certainly alarming to see initially, but it isn't irreparable. So let's compare some amp glow. I love doing this with camera reviews and we're going to look at some dark frames right now. This is a two minute dark frame and this is a five minute dark frame. This is 10 minutes. 30 minutes. So we can see the amp glow gets worse and worse and worse as you take longer and longer exposures, which is kind of a given. Again, I don't think you'd really be using this camera for half an hour though. In practice, I use this camera for about two or three minutes per exposure, depending on the target. When I went to narrowband, it was more so about five minutes per image. When I shot this picture of the elephant's trunk nebula, there were five minute long HA images. Same again with the tadpole nebula in that other video I did. There were about five minute long SHO sub exposures. But when I photographed the Perseus double cluster being an open star cluster, I actually went down to 30 second LRGB images. And to be honest, I think the picture came up really well considering it's a star cluster. They're really bright. You should use short exposures. Otherwise, I found no real reason to complain about the exposures themselves. There was decent dynamic range and there's a lot of room to play about with ed in editing. I mean, you gain some dynamic range back in stacking, so... But I really didn't have any complaints about editing these photos. As mentioned earlier, the 183mm Pro is more suited to those wider field of views. In practice and under regular scene conditions, it would really enjoy being slap bang somewhere between 248 millimeters and 742 millimeters to sample correctly. Let's look at some examples at those focal lengths. 300 millimeters, you could shoot M16 the Eagle Nebula and NGC 2244 the Rosette. At 400 millimeters, you could, for example, do NGC 2064. 600 millimeters, we're looking at M101. And 700 millimeters, we're looking at M106, which is one of the pictures I like to take in with this LRGB setup as well on my Skywatcher. The effect of this sensor size and this crop factor can be clearly demonstrated if we compare the 183 sensor against something like the OE71 sensor on the Orion Nebula. Let's have a look. So at this focal length, you can clearly see the tighter field of view. So again, just go into Stellarium or Astronomy Tools, one of those, just make sure you're happy. So being part of the ZWO Pro series, it's got two-stage cooling. This is two-stage Peltier cooling or electronically cooled, basically. It can go 40 degrees Celsius below ambient temperature. It does require an external power source though. And as always, they don't supply a plug in the box. So make sure you get your own plug but it can be powered from the ASI Air Plus and the ASI Air Pro. I've personally used both and it's just fine. When I used this camera, I cooled it down to about minus 15 degrees Celsius, which was a sweet spot for no condensation on the window here and nice images and lack of thermal noise. Now, it doesn't mean you have to necessarily crank the cooling up to 100%. 
So I have a video from Dr. Glover of SharpCap going into more detail about how to cool your camera. That can be found in the video description. A quick note about the center window condensing up. I have seen this on other 183 models and to help combat this, ZWO do supply this aftermarket ring heater that goes around the body of the camera. It does require its own separate power source though and that helps combat this. The 183 does support video. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if you put it on a deep focal length instrument, especially with a Barlow thrown in there for good measure, you're gonna have a planet killer. 183 users, if you take video with it, please share the experience in the comments down below. At the time of this review, the 183 mono camera clocks in at about 947 pounds for the cooled version or 669 pounds for the uncooled mono version. And for that price tag, you get a relatively small sensor, a lot of pixels, a really good camera for wider field of views and probably a really good planetary camera. But that is a considerable chunk of change to drop on a camera, especially the cooled version. The 183 Mono only weighs in at 410 grams. That's 14.4 ounces. So it doesn't actually really add much weight to an imaging setup. But do bear in mind, again, it is the Mono version. You will need to get a filter wheel, filters, and probably an autofocuser. So just factor that into your weight budget when you're designing your rig. And much like every other Pro Series camera that ZWO does, it's got the power port, it's got a USB 3.0 B-type in USB port, and it's got a two port USB hub built into it. They are USB type A. So this basically means that you can plug autofocuses, filter wheels, things like that. I've even had my guide camera going through this before and this worked absolutely fine. Whilst the 183 sensor is getting on a bit in its life, it's in no way obsolete or useless. The 12-bit ADC sensor packs a punch, even in that relatively small form factor. It makes a really good wide field camera. It also is good for lucky imaging, planetary work, and EAA, electronically assisted astrophotography, or electronically assisted astronomy. Best suited for short exposures, but 40 megabytes per image means that you're going to suck up your storage quite quickly, especially if you have multiple clear nights, something I don't have a problem with. So just bear in mind that with your memory on your computer. I found that images from the 183 responded really well to darks, dark flats and flat frames. Those darks are certainly needed though to calibrate out this severe amp glow this sensor brings to the table. One other advantage of the smaller sensor is that it in theory uses only the very best part of your optics, the dead center. So the center of your lens, the center of your mirror, anything like that. So Whilst that could be an advantage, remember the other flip side of that is the relatively tighter field of view. Take your time familiarizing yourself with the camera, the calibration frames and the field of view and you'll end up with a camera capable of very really nice high quality images, ideal for 4K desktops, wallpapers or printing. Thanks very much for watching everybody. If you've enjoyed this video then go ahead and give it a thumbs up and if you think it could have done better go ahead and hit that thumbs down button and consider subscribing for more reviews such as this. So what do you think of the 183 sensor? Does the tight but efficient sensor seem appealing to you? Drop me a comment down below. And with that, it's time to say thanks very much. Clear skies, everyone. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.